Okay, guys, the uh, session on web socket is over. We'll start the next session right now because of some uh, timing this thing. So we're going to start the next one on gRPC. And the first thing you need to do for that is build the image for the hands-on part right now. I shared the uh, instructions on Slack. Uh, how many of you already built the image? You need to go to the gRPC folder and Docker build. I think most of you are able to build the uh, command. So now you can leave it and come for the theory part. Uh, let's just uh, understand what RPC is and then we can get to the hands-on later. So you guys must have heard RPC mentioned a couple of times, right? Did you hear it in somebody's uh, invited talk? Can somebody nod if you were listening to the invited talks? Mm -hmm. You heard someone mention the uh, invited talks, right? Uh, so they mentioned that for microservice architecture, they were using RPC for communication between the different microservices. So RPC stands for remote procedure calls. Let's just see what it is. So we have been seeing a lot of different protocols, right? So we already saw the HTTP protocol. And WebSockets uh, had a different uh, structure. It had a different uh, goal. But the HTTP was a request response protocol. And RPC is also a request response protocol. So why do we need another one? Right, so request response protocol is where the client sends a request, server does some computing, and then it responds back to the client. So we all have used local calls that is just a normal function call in your programs, right? So if you have a process which has, say, a frontend uh, uh, .py code and a backend .py code, and suppose there's a function in backend called get user, which takes a string and returns a user. A user is just a struct over here, right? And frontend can call the fu function in the backend by just referring to the function as get user. You guys have all used functions normally, right? Functions have arguments, signature, and all that. So this is what is known as a local call. A remote call is basically this, but this happens remotely. So we want two processes running on two different machines. The frontend and the backend, same frontend and backend, but we want them to be running on two different machines. And we want the same function call, a function that exists in the backend, to be called by a some code which exists in the front end. And we want this to happen. This happens through RPCs. And we want this to happen without us being aware of whether the function exists locally in your system or exists in some remote system. Completely unaware, you just call the function and it will something will take care of the underlying thing to see whether it has to be uh, code running on your own system or somewhere else. This is the nice goal, but what happens is that you don't get complete transparency. Transparency is when you don't care about the underlying implementation. You don't get complete transparency. You can be a little bit aware, but you can have minimal uh, coding changes to make it uh, make remote calls possible. Now let's see what is the biggest blocker if you want to do a remote call uh, to, to some code on another machine. So first of all, a normal function call, right? It's just, if you have done some compilers sort of courses, you have seen that a normal function call, it it has to put uh, call, do the function call in the stack and all that, right? So all of that is how a fu normal function call happens. A remote call, the moment you get two machines running, or two uh, uh, programs running on two different machines, you need to have a network call if it has to happen between two remote machines. And which means the network call will come with its own issues, losses, reordering, etc. And now they all both, both need to talk with some protocol. It could be TCP, it could be something, but they both need to agree on that. And secondly, you need to appreciate this when we write the code, that client and server are two completely two different processes. And if, you if you're sending some data across these two machines, they both need to agree on the same data. In HTTP, we're sending data through JSON or something, right? Now we're talking about code. Code, which just normal function, which just uses normal structures. And how can two different processes running on two different machines agree on this, uh, on these data structures? So we're saying we want to call a function, this is a get user function, which wants to get some user data, which is in the form of a structure, a struct called user. On one side, you have one code which says get user of struct, and on the other side, you have this code which actually does this implementation. How does the client and the server know that this is struct user? User could have some name, ID, address, right? Both of them need to know that the user is a structure which has name, ID, and address, which means they both need to somehow communicate this information between themselves. Why does HTTP not, this have, not have this problem? We have done client-server programming in HTTP. That's because HTTP uses this JSON format. JSON is a pre-agreed format that everyone agrees upon. You don't get any nice uh, normal data structures. You have to follow this, the same uh, key, colon, value, 
pattern and that is how you can say that you can get any number of uh, entry point uh, data points in this format and this is how they both agree on the data structure. So let's just see how RPC happens between two, this is one machine one and this is machine two. We're going to call this the client machine which means this is going to be calling a function and that function actually exists on this machine. So let's assume there's a function that exists on this machine and the cli client needs to call the function like it's just local. So there's a purple function here that it wants to call and it wants to call it like it, like just get user, right? So what it calls is some function get user but that function is not this remote function. What it ends up calling is a function that lies on its own machine. This is a local call, everything is nice and normal. And what does this function call do? The, the function that is running on its own machine, it should do this networking, it should do this data translation. So it will say, okay, this client has called with this arguments. Now I need to first convert the arguments into an actual network message so that it can send this message uh, to the server and has to perform a network call. This network call could also be a HTTP call, for instance. It ha because RPC is just a protocol, this protocol could be implemented on top of HTTP. If you want to imagine something, you can just imagine that the underlying call is happening over HTTP. So this client stub, this is the official term we call stub, gets the call from the client uh, caller function and it convert, makes a HTTP message which says this is the function that the client wants to call and this is the data that the client is sending to that function. And this is being sent all the way to the server stub. Again, server stub is the thing that will handle the remote part of it so that both sides, the caller and the callee, think that everything is happening locally. So the server stub, what did it just get? It got a function, it got that the client wants to call a function along with its arguments. So it receives a data packet, it is going to decode it to convert it into the argument and the, uh, and the, uh, into the function and the arguments for the function. And it has to now call the local procedure. Again, this is just running on the server machine. So it is a local call. Both sides, the function call is local and the networking part is done by the stubs. It calls the function like it is local, since it is local with the, uh, with the, uh, with the arguments that was passed. Local call executes normally like any normal uh, function call. And then you get the result. Now the result has to be sent back to the client. So now the result again goes through the server stub, which packages so that it can be sent on the network and then it sends that back to the client and then the client call, client callee caller function gets the response as though it just happened locally. This will take a lot of time because it happened over the network but the client just thinks that it has happened locally because it just called a function on itself. So now, now the client had called a function, say get user with some user struct. So two things that the client should know, it should know the exact function signature. If there's get user, which needs a user name or user ID, the client should know that that is the argument for that function and that argument data structure should be shared between the server and the client. And both of this is handled by what is known as a specification. Specification is just a general name. In RPC, it's called a specification. We will see the gRPC example in a little bit more detail because that is a more popular one and you might be more interested in that if you're going to actually code a microservice which wants to talk to each other. So specification, in database you have the schema and all that, right? Specification is just saying, this is what we both agree upon. So specification has a schema which has the message format which is the data structure and the function signature. So these are the two things we really care about and this, uh, both of this uh, are something that the server and client should both know and this schema says that both the server and client have the schema and both, so that both of them follow the same function signature and the function arguments. But you also saw that some of, a lot of the heavy lifting was being done by these two pieces the client stub and the server stub. They were doing the remote call part of it, they were doing the networking, they were doing the uh, translating the arguments part. So this stub has to also be created. It should have encoding and decoding logic because it is converting HTTP message or some message into arguments, function arguments and function call. And this happens in the language that the server and client is written in, which means this is very language dependent. Again, the whole thing of specification is not there in HTTP. HTTP somehow bypasses all of this because it uses JSON. What is the problem with JSON? Why can't we just continue using JSON? There are a couple of issues with JSON. The first thing is that JSON is human readable. It's all text based. It says key, value, ID, colon, this thing. And machines actually when talking to each other don't need to be, don't need to pass strings between themselves. They don't need to be human readable because it, efficiency is better than 
a human readability there, right? So you can have a more, much more efficient protocol which just converts it into binary because machines can talk to each other with bin in binary. The second thing is that JSON, everything is strings in JSON. If, if you saw, remember the to-do app yesterday, it was called one colon some to-do string, right? There is no types in JSON. And if you use C, C++, you will know the types are very important. If a function expects an int, it should get an int. If it expects a single character, it should get the character. So if you pass a string instead, there's going to be a lot of issues for function uh, compatibility. So J, uh, let me talk about both the efficiency part and the type part. So this is what a JSON of a user struct could look like, right? ID is this, name is this, and email is this. Very simple. I don't think there should be a semicolon there. Uh, this is what, this is specifically the gRPC example, but you can think of what a normal RPC specification will look like. So basically the specification says that this is what a person struct looks like. It says int ID and these two are of type string. This is pre-agreed between the server and the client. They both agree that this is the specification they're gonna follow. Now that you have agreed upon the specification, this no specification happens in HTTP. Now that you've agreed upon a specification, your messages can actually be quite short. In fact, what you'll just say is, this is the first field, this is the second field, this is the third field, right? You don't need to send that name is Ashok and into a, ID is this, right? You can make your message quite short by just sending in the specific data. In fact, this is exactly what the gRPC message looks like. After I, it's not readable, you'll have to convert that into the binary format of it. But it basically just says, this is one, we said this is the tag one, two, three, right? It says one is values this, two is values this, three is values this. So very, very short and compressed. And because it's a network call, which could be going across the van or uh, LAN, all the, all the savings you do here will actually uh, count. So one specific implementation of RPC is gRPC. RPC has been around for a long time. It's been there since 1960s or so. gRPC is Google's RPC, except G is not actually signed for Google. Every version, they called it something different. They called it great. They called it uh, uh, gorgeous or something like that. They called it something different. They did everything except Google for uh, the G. It only came out in around 2015. Uh, what, are, what, are, was it, what does it do specifically? Uh, it builds on top of TCP so that all the reliability and reordering is taken care uh, automatically. It actually uses TLS, so it also gets security uh, free out of the box. The second thing it does is use HTTP2. HTTP2 was Google's, gRPC is Google, so they're just able to use their own protocols. And what they get with HTTP2 is binary encoding out of the box because HTTP2 encodes all messages in binary instead of plain text. So this also they got freely and they also got multiplexing freely. So it, it was able, it, apart from just the performance of using a specification, it was able to get a lot of performance benefits just by using all of these. But the overall protocol remains the same, where you have a schema, a specification, in gRPC, this is called a protocol buffer, in case you've heard of it before. There was even a poster yesterday about protocol buffers, in case you noted it. So protocol buffers is the specification, what it calls the specification. It has two things, the part in pink and the part in blue. Pink is messages, is what a protocol buffers term for it is, and it, you can think of it as the equivalent of structs. And blue is the service, according to gRPC, and that is what the functions are. Function means you will say, this is my function name, it takes something of type user, returns something of type user ID. It clearly says that this is the uh, input type and this is the output type. And anything you make up here, you're, you need to have equivalent messages so that it understands that this is the, this is the type. That user has these, these fields, these, these uh, things that is there and user ID, the return type also should have a, this thing. So once you create the schema, what you do is both the server and the client should get the schema. And what they, this is called a proto file. This protocol buffer, it will be like you have .c and .c++, this will be called .proto. And what you have to do is compile the proto. And why do we compile the proto? Remember the client stub and the server stub. That was doing all the heavy lifting. You compile the proto so that you get the client stub and the server stub generated for you in whichever language you want. So this is a, one of the biggest advantages of gRPC. It supports a lot of languages. And this generation does
create a message type for the input and the output. So how many messages are you going to create? Two. One for the input and one for the output. Once you create the messages, we can then fill in the RPC itself. The, there is a function call to say take this as input and take that as output. But let's just fill the messages first. And you can use this as the format for how a message should look like. It should have a um, type, it should have a name, you can create, use any name you want. And it should have this increasing tag IDs so that you can distinguish between them. Okay, so I hope you're all creating two messages, one called input, one called output. The input should have two integers and the output should have one integer. These are the data types that the function will be expecting as input and output. If you have some version and want to check if it's correct or not, in the readme there's a, uh, there's a instruction for compilation. And if you do that, the grpc folder and if you do that you can see if you are running into any issues it will might might like a normal compiler it will tell you you have a semicolon missing here you have something that missing there you can just follow those instructions to fix your proto file okay sorry about that i apparently made a typo in this which is why you might it's in 32 not i32 uh, please build using the command in the readme here this so this is the command that actually compiles the Python uh, compiles a proto file and as you can see here Python out equal to says that you want the proto the client and server stubs written in Python. If it compiles successfully you should be able to see two files in your exercises directory. Okay, so you have implemented, you have written some proto file right. Did you ever put anything that A plus B is the result in that proto file? No, right? So the actual calculator add is not there anywhere in this. That's because this is just a specification. This is just talking about the things that matter to the server and client, which is how should I talk? How is the function itself implemented is not the specification's problem. It is a server's problem. So when we go and fill in the server.py, we have to actually write the specification, the functionality for this add function or whatever you have called it. But at the spec level, you don't care about how the, what the add function is. The function could be named anything. This is just so that client and server have the same format that they can talk uh, in. Okay, there'll be one file called calc underscore pb2.py. If you just open it, you will see whatever the input and output you had named, right? The message type. You will see those around there somewhere. So this file contains the message types equivalent. So just open your calc and uh, whatever your underscore pb2.py and see if you are able to locate the input and output types in that file. So I named my messages and the functions differently. So this example that I've written here will be different. So you have to read it with the context of your, your uh, types and what your names, right? So can you locate this service tub uh, function there, class there? So this is a client side stub that is generated in the uh, grpc.py file. Uh, I think it depends, uh, this is what you named your service and it will be followed by stub. So can you just find something that is called stub there, a class called stub there, right? So it will have this self dot and this again would be what you named your function, self dot the add function in which it adds, it says a lot of stuff. So this is on the client side. So client side we have something called a st some stub which has an add function. So this means that your client side code can call this class stub dot add function and that is how it is able to call the function locally. So you need, to do a, you need to do a local invocation on the client side, you need to, do call, you need to call something on the server side. So the client side what it calls and what it thinks is a remote call is this stub dot add. Okay, you can just Look at these three theoretically and then you can go to your uh, server and client.py and make changes. The second thing is 
something servicer. Can you locate the servicer in your code as well? Which will have the same add function and it will it'll actually say that it is not implemented. So this means that the server side has to create this, has to inherit this class and create an add function and actually give the implementation here. So this is where you implement your add function. So this is how client can call the add function and this is how server can say that this is the add function that I want to implement when somebody calls add. And the third thing is that actually if you look at it, right, it, it is, it's supposed to be a call, but the server side actually has to be waiting the whole time for any client to call it and then say that I want this function to be called, which means the server, the, the code on the B side actually has to be a server, which means it has to be waiting actively for any connections to come. And if it calls a function that it knows how to handle, it has to call that function. So you need to make the B side code an actual server. And this is what does that. So this says that you need to add for a call called add, this is the function that needs to be called. So this, so this is a gRPC server that is created, which calls the add function on the server side. So if on the client side, so first on the client side, you need to create you need to create this self dot, uh, you need to create this add function so that it, you can call it locally. On the, uh, on the server side, you need to implement this add function. And finally, you need to add, you need to join this add function to a server so that some ad server can actively listen for any calls to this, uh, for this function. So let's first take the server uh, code. You have a server.py, which will have some question marks, which we need to fill in this order. So the last two, last two uh, slides were supposed to help you with this thing. So let's just try doing this and if you have any issues, we can use the last two, uh, last two uh, slides to help us with this part. So first you need to import the two generated Python files. That will be the question marks on top. The second thing is, this is a server. So the second thing it has to do is actually implement the add function. So that is what is called when somebody calls you. This is, this is the second uh, job you need to do. And third is that you have to make a server actually listen to this uh, function. So let's just first do the import and then you'll see a class there. So there your uh, class calculator or something, which you have to inherit from the class that was created and I have an add function inside. So let's just do that part. Just open server.py. First you'll have to import uh, statements. So you need to import the generated files so that you can actually use the functions and the data types that are in these uh, generated files. So the second thing we need to do is create our own class so that we can override the add method that was in this location. So this one has an add function which would be called but it doesn't have any implementation so you need to give an implementation. So for this we create our own class which inherits. So I, I assume you guys know about the uh, concepts of inheritance, right? So basically if you give uh, in this bracket, if you give a base class, you can give your own function which will override the implementation in the base class. And there is no implementation in the base class, so it's fine. So you need to, the second thing you need to do is inherit from this class here. You need to find what the equivalent of this is in your code. Inherit from this class and write your own add function. So first, are you able to locate where this is in the generated code? Are you able to see something which says def add and unimplemented? Can you all raise your hands if you can see this somewhere in your code? Please open the g, uh, underscore grpc.py, see if you are able to find this code. And this means that this is the base class that you need to inherit from. So just grab this base class and use that over here for the, uh, for this new class that you are creating. Okay, were you able to locate this thing? Can someone tell me? Um, I forgot your name. <laughs> okay, Arjun, you tell me. What is this thing called in your, what is this class called in your uh, gRPC file? Okay, add server, uh, it'll be add, serv add servicer, right? Okay, so this class in the server, you need to put this in the question mark there. Next, we need to write the add function itself. So you need a function here. You must have called this function in the RPC. You must have defined something over here in the RPC. This is what will be written over here. The same function you need to write over here. 
So if you see in this function, request is the exact type that you had defined in your proto file. So you can access its fields using request dot input one or whatever you had called it. And you need to return the result. You can't just return A plus B. You have to return the type that you had created. So you need to create an object of the type in the gen in the uh, pb2.py uh, file or actually you can see right you, you must have created something some uh, object of the type response. You need to create that object here and put the res response put the sum inside that object so that you are returning something of the type that you had created output type or whatever you had created. You guys can try for five more minutes I can share the uh, solution after that so that you can know what where you're off and what it needs to look like okay hey guys I hope you have been able to make some other progress so we'll break for lunch now then there's an invited talk session and then 3 30 we'll come back and we can do this for some more time and then go to the next session so you can all uh, leave for lunch now take a break